Okay, welcome everyone to Between the Shoots with Medical Fitness TV. Our guest today is Andrea Leonard, who we hope to have uh, an intimate conversation with. Uh, we'll ask her some uh, interesting personal questions, find out a little bit about her as a person, but primarily we're going to dive into what she does professionally and uh, the amazing impact that she has on the medical fitness community. Andrea is president and founder of the Cancer Exercise Training Institute and has been a member of the advisory board for the Medical Fitness Network now for more than three years. And Andrea, welcome, and I'm Thank excited you. to talk to you. Thanks, Tony. Well, thank you for joining us. And um, what I'd like to ask you first is just, you know, how you got started in the health and fitness industry and what was your motivation and what was your first job in the industry? How long do I have? <laughs> we have a... Uh, no, we're... I better start. Um, well, um, okay, so my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 15. And we'll just put that on the back burner because I really didn't get what was going on at the time. So when I was 18, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And I had a complete thyroidectomy. And for anybody who doesn't know what the thyroid does, pretty much controls everything. So I had no energy. I was gaining weight. And as I was going into college, uh, it wasn't a great start for me. Um, it was kind of a, a, a downward spiral of eating disorders, not necessarily as neat as anorexia and bulimia, but this whole body dysmorphic disorder. Um, and that led me to pursue a career as a personal trainer. So while I was originally destined to be a CIA agent, and uh, <laughs> big, big turn of events there, so I, I got certified by ACSM and NASM and Cooper Institute and ACE, and I got every certification I could um, to help myself because I figured if I was a trainer, then I would naturally stay fit and you know learn how to eat and that kind of thing. And, and it worked for the most part. Um, but unfortunately, with hormones and life changes, the thyroid, or lack thereof, uh, kind of has a mind of its own. So then, fast forward, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer for the second time in 1996, and I had been a trainer for about five years at the time, and she asked me if I would help her in her recovery, because the first time she was never told what to do, and she had a frozen shoulder and permanent nerve damage and was addicted to narcotics and spent a summer in Johns Hopkins. So I was training her breast surgeon, uh, who was one of the top surgeons in Washington, D.C., and I said, Dr. Alley, what do you think about writing a book for breast cancer and exercise? She said, I think that'd be great. And this is before the internet really got going, and there was virtually no information about cancer exercise. So I spent three years with the chiefs of breast surgery at Georgetown, GW, and Johns Hopkins, and we wrote what came to be known as Essential Exercises for Breast Cancer Survivors. And to this day, it's still, I like to think of it as the Bible for breast cancer patients and survivors. And it's the one and only progressive resistance program because there's been so much pushback from the medical community all these years as to, you know, what the limits are and who can do what. And everybody wants to err on the side of caution to the point where, uh, you know, we've got um, comorbidities as a result of not exercising. So. Um, the book was published in 2000. I shortly thereafter moved from Washington, D.C. to Portland, um, gave up a thriving personal training business to kind of start all over, which I have mixed feelings about my choice, but nonetheless, it was my destiny, I guess. So I started what was called the Breast Cancer Survivors Foundation, which was a nonprofit, and I was raising money to give survivors grants so that they could work free of charge with a cancer exercise specialist. And at the time, I had created maybe a 40-page book on breast cancer and exercise separate from, from the published book. And I would tote around the country, and I had a dry erase board, and I would go for four people, six people, eight people, whatever, and do a workshop, and somebody would become a breast cancer exercise specialist or whatever I called it back then. And then realizing there was a much bigger need, uh, in 2004, I kind of rolled that into what is now the Cancer Exercise Training Institute and cover 25 types of cancer, as well as pediatrics, surgeries, treatments, uh, mental fatigue, physical fatigue, lymphedema, you name it, everything there is 
about cancer and how exercise can help people to really take control of their lives. Cancer strips you of everything. And to be able to give somebody some control over their body at a time that they feel that they have no control is incredibly empowering, not only for the patient, but also for me or for whomever is working with that client or patient. Hmm. So that's, that's kind of the sort of Reader's Digest version. All right. And along the way, have you had um, mentors or a specific mentor that you could point to that um, was helpful in your development? Uh, you know, it, it's interesting because somebody else just asked me this question uh, in another interview. I don't remember <laughs> what it was about. I guess no. I'm just super popular lately. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't have a mentor. I mean, I did this all by myself. Um, I really didn't have anybody guiding me. I created a board of advisors and I had, you know, medical professionals that would give me, obviously I didn't make all this information up myself, so I needed professional guidance, but I didn't have anyone inspiring me other than my mother and all of the other cancer patients out there to, to do this, to, to create change in this, this industry. Um, and I wish I had. I didn't have anybody giving me money. I didn't have anybody giving me advice. I didn't know how to use a computer. I didn't know how to use a PowerPoint. Hence, I was traveling around with a dry erase board. Um, so I kind of taught myself everything, learned everything the hard way. And to this day, my 21-year-old son, who has taken up videography and photography, is teaching me how to do things now and do social media. So. I'm, I'm a little bit old school in that respect, um, and I, I, would, I would say it's about as grassroots as you could get. So um, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I yeah. would say that my, my motivation, not necessarily my mentor, are all the people that I have had the personal experience of working with and seeing what they've gone through and just, just hearing other stories, um, even if it's from the people that I trained who are then working with cancer patients. That is a continuous inspiration to me. And there have been a few times where I wanted to quit and I kind of dropped out of it for a few months and did some loony things. But I always ended up drawn back into it because I feel like this is really my calling. But it's been very difficult because as a fitness professional, I wasn't always taken seriously. You know, oh, you're just a personal trainer. Who are you? And um, I was like, I didn't make this up. I worked with this breast surgeon and this chief of plastic surgery and this occupational therapist, and you know, it's a cumulative effort. I'm just, I'm the puppet. Because in order to have all of these experts present on this topic, it would cost a bloody fortune and, and it would be, it wouldn't be feasible for anybody. Nobody would be able to afford to take that kind of a course. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that. Here, uh, this little section we'll call um, your favorites, you know, um, so we'll ask you a couple of questions about what some of your favorite things are. So do you have um, a couple of favorite colors that uh, you like and also um, do they impact you in any way specifically? Well, this is kind of peculiar. My favorite colors are deep purple and deep brown. Okay. So, I got a dog that was deep brown. I had a hard time finding one that was purple. <laughs> so, and I actually, I'm mesmerized by her color. But there's something about the richness and the warmth of chocolatey brown that I just love. Um, and I don't know what it is with purple. I just, it, it's a very particular purple. It's not lavender. It's not bright purple. It's just kind of a dark eggplant purple. And the two of them together are very soothing to me. Um, however, the theme in my house, this is about the brightest area in my house, but um, we added an addition, so upstairs is like a log cabin, and which brings me to my other favorite thing, but the colors, everything's very warm and dark red and, and rust and brown and brown and brown and a couple pops of purple here and there, but I think it's, it's just really warm to me, and I'm... I love cozy. I'm somewhat of an anomaly. Um, while everybody else would like to be at the beach, I'm waiting for it to dump snow at the mountain, and I could live in winter all year round. So, um, I ha oh, I have a purple snowboard jacket, and <laughs> and uh, yeah. my pants have purple in them, and I wanted a purple snowboard, but haven't been able to find one yet. Awesome. 
Okay, yeah, uh, your top three uh, favorite musicians or bands. You mentioned you were old school within the world of like education. <laughs> I'm an old school '80s rock girl too. But oh. um, actually, my new favorite band is Zach Brown Band. Love Zach Brown Band. Um, when I'm driving to the mountain, it's about an hour and 15 minute ride, and I'm like, Siri, play me some Zach Brown Band. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, like, that's my like driving music. Um, I okay, I'll, and this is like a little too personal, but I loved Bon Jovi, but now it reminds me of an, he reminds me of an ex-husband, so I don't like it so much anymore. Ah. <laughs> um, and then, God, what do I listen to mostly? I like Katy Perry. I'm not giving you the old school, am I? But I'm like ACDC. Oh. Um, uh, 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 Def Leppard, love Def Leppard, um, Van Halen, Scorpions, Judas Priest, so Lord. all that stuff is on my play mix. I mean, I go from Frank Sinatra to to Dawkins, you know, and everything in between. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw Scorpions in concert probably 30 years ago. and uh, We might we... have been at the same concert. I was at Irvine Meadows. That's where I was. No way. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was like 19... 91, so not quite 30 uh, years ago. Yeah, well, the guy that opened up on my show was Kip Winger. Did Winger open up for... Uh, I don't remember. Winger, the band Winger? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't I don't remember, but uh, I just remember it was at Irvine Meadows. That was like lifetimes ago, because I, yeah. uh, I lived in Orange County for a year after college. Okay, all right, outstanding. Uh, okay, dogs, cats. Birds, fish, or <laughs> dogs. like the zoo. So I have a German short hair pointer who's my brown baby, and then we have two whippets who are my step babies, uh, and then I have two cats that are 13 years old, cougar and panther, and so <laughs> they have the downstairs, and then the other three dogs are sitting over here, um, and then the, the German short hair is my my shadow she she go where i go she goes so she's she's my bff i love that you're so you're surrounded by a lot of life around you yeah that's yeah you, you have to be because if you could see outside my window it's gloomy gray and rainy and that's yeah. how it is a lot so right. i try and create a warm environment like i, I pretty much make a fire every night um I, I like burning candles that smell like pumpkin spice, and I, I love autumn, but um, but winter's my favorite because of snowboarding and skiing. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I was going to say you're a winter and a holiday person, and um, excellent. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, getting back on a serious note for a moment, um, continuing education for fitness professionals obviously um, is important. Uh, but given the aging population, and maybe not even the fact that we have an aging population, but from your experiences within the community that you um, service, why do you think continuing education is so important, even for the most knowledgeable fitness professionals? Well, I've had this discussion with many people, and I can speak obviously about cancer in specific, because cancer is really hundreds of diseases. You know, unlike, you know, with diabetes, you have juvenile diabetes, and you have type 1, you have type 2, um, and then you have, I can't think of what it's called when you get pregnant and have diabetes. Gestation. Thank you. <laughs> I'm in <laughs> cancer mode. But, you know, so, so you've got, you know, three specific things. And then with cancer, you've got basically any part of your body can have a cancer. And then you've got the complications from surgeries and from treatments and my point in, in saying this is particularly with cancer, it is ever changing. So I find it an impossible situation to certify somebody or qualify somebody to be a cancer exercise specialist when the information is going to be completely different in a year or two years. And unfortunately, there are organizations that are out there that are now doing that. From the very beginning, I am now in my 11th edition of the handbook since 2004, and that is because I update it every two years, which is still a lot of time in between editions. But through social media and through our website, you know, I'm constantly posting things and any any new um, research or, or procedures that I come across so that people have that available to them in between 
you know, recertification. It's not supposed to be called recertification, but requalification or, you know, whatever words we want to use. But unfortunately, a lot of people, like the follow through is not great. I lose a lot of people who don't come. I mean, a lot of people do keep going, but a lot of them drop off and they continue to say they're a cancer exercise specialist and they're not. Because if they can't pass that test again, and the, the only way we're going to know is to make them take that test again. So they have a choice with us. They get the new handbooks and they take a new exam, or we have different courses internally that are all specific to cancer that they can take. Because I don't care if they take a kickboxing class or a BOSU class or a TRX class. That means nothing to me as far as renewing their uh, advanced qualification. So in terms of all of the other medical fitness populations, absolutely it applies to everybody. I just, I'm dealing with such a huge umbrella with the information that I'm providing that um, I, I just, that, that's where my focus has to be. Got it. Do you think um, that medical fitness or fitness as medicine is truly a viable career path for fitness professionals or do you think it's more of like a, a plug-in for most people who become a fitness professional are still going to focus in on um, body fat loss or more appearance things. Do you think there's a viable career path for somebody who just wants to be like fitness as medicine or, or medical fitness oriented? Absolutely. And I think those two groups are going to separate themselves. You know, when I became a trainer at first, that's what I wanted. I wanted to give people six packs and get them ripped and help them to lose weight and shred and this and that. I have no desire to do that anymore. None. Yeah. Because the challenge for me and the reward is taking somebody who's really incapacitated, who has a real challenge, not, you know, losing five pounds or competing. And I'm not minimizing that. There's a place for that. But those two different populations of professionals are going to separate. But then there's this crossover that, that a lot of people don't realize. Um, and it's really been a phenomenon to me that I've had a very difficult time getting people in Southern California and Southern Florida <laughs> to partake in this training. And yeah. In, in processing this myself, I think, okay, well, you've got all these beautiful people in bathing suits and fit and this and that, and the trainers are focused on putting people in bathing suits and getting them, you know, beach ready. But what they're not thinking of is that a good percentage of those people, if they don't have a disease now, they are going to. We are all getting older. So there will always be a place for just kind of like the meathead mentality, if you will. And, and then you've got not meathead, but you've got the athletic trainers, which is absolutely necessary with collegiate and professional athletes and that type of thing, competitive athletes. And then you're going to have the people that are specific to medical fitness. Um, but I, I think that the people who are in those other two groups would benefit by being privy to this information because inevitably their clients also are going to have some condition. I mean, my son's a college basketball player, but he has type 1 diabetes. So the athletic trainer has to also understand diabetes. Right. And As does everybody that, around him. Yeah, that, that's just a fact. Um, and, and without understanding that, they are, in a sense, putting him at risk because if he goes unconscious and they don't understand what to do, he dies. Right. So, and that, that's a very graphic example, but, you know, we, we have everything in between um, from, you know, working with cancer patients and, uh, you know, for example, somebody who's had a mastectomy and, and they're rounded forward because of scar tissue and maybe radiation and adhesions, and the trainer who doesn't know what they're doing has them do bench presses, which just right. exacerbates that. Or um, they're going through reconstruction and they've got them doing chest flies or push-ups or whatever when they shouldn't be doing any chest exercise at all. So if you're not going to be a specialist, then don't pretend to be. You know, you can't just, I think the, the big problem with the industry is all of the trainers that don't have special medical fitness training that are working with those populations because they were already clients and then they got diagnosed with cancer or they got diabetes or they had a heart attack. Um, and they're really doing their client a huge disservice and they're putting themselves at risk legally because without adequate training in that specific arena, it is negligent. And if, if a lawyer can prove gross negligence, that trainer's career is over. And I, I preach about this in my workshops. 
Um, you know, you have to go by doctor's orders, whether you like it or not. If a doctor prescribes something, you don't argue. And you've got to have your medical clearance above all else. You know, and, and there's all these I's that need to be dotted and T's that need to be crossed. And without that, um, it, it's putting the industry at, as a whole at risk because it, it, it makes us less credible in the eyes of the medical profession. Well, uh, you will be presenting for Medical uh, Fitness Education Foundation at the Medical Fitness Tour in New Jersey, I believe, next year. Yeah, yeah Rowan and, University. Do you know what the, have you, I'm sure you've settled in on the title. Can you share a little bit about uh, what you'll uh, <laughs> talk about? <laughs> huh. Uh, well, it'll be, it'll essentially, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't remember exactly what I put it down as, but it's basically going to be an, like an introduction to cancer exercise. Yeah. So it's going to give people a good enough idea of what they need to know with, by no means making them an expert. And that's the thing. It's, it's like, it, it's, I don't want to call it a teaser because it's not that. It's to pique somebody's interest for them to determine if this is the avenue that they want to go down, but also to let them know that, you know, I'm going to scare the, the, the life out of you because if, if you don't want to understand this, yeah, you're putting yourself at risk. You're putting the client at risk. So I, I do want to scare somebody straight so that they will get educated. Um, people, I've often kind of tossed around my frustration with why, you know, you, you go to um, like an idea convention and it's packed and you've got like PRX and BOSU and yoga lotties and Pi yoga and you know, whatever else. And it's packed because everybody's like having fun and they're working out. And then you have a medical fitness conference and it remains to be seen, you know, what, what the audience is, but, but just personally like filling cancer workshops is difficult because yeah. it, people are like, ugh, cancer, that's depressing. But, you know, you're probably working with cancer patients, and whether you know it or not, depressing or not, it is reality. Yeah. You know, in our lifetime, pretty much every one out of two of us is going to get cancer. Well, it would be great preparatory work as well, because if you're not working with someone who has cancer, you are bound to work with someone who's going to get cancer and will yeah, have unfortunately, cancer. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah. The other thing, I do a lot of kind of basic uh, biomechanics, anatomy, postural assessments. Uh, I teach people how to do goniometry to measure shoulder range of motion uh, and, and really to put together a comprehensive individualized programming. And the beauty of this is that it can be applied to anybody. It can be applied to working with adolescents, with athletes, with seniors in a group setting, in an individual setting. So I always tell people when they're sitting in the workshop at the very beginning, I'm like, all right, look, you guys. Um, there are going to be some of you after this weekend that are not going to want to do this. And I, that's perfectly okay. It is not for everybody. Some of you will just take your CEUs and run with it. Some of you may apply what I teach you to working with other populations. And others of you will go on to work with cancer patients. But it is not for everyone. But people think that cancer is a death sentence. And what they don't realize is that I think the numbers are 23 million people by 2030 that are going to be living with cancer, not dying up. I mean, we are going to lose a lot of people, yeah. but we have an opportunity to help these people not only recover from this cancer, but prevent other cancers and prevent heart disease and diabetes and osteoporosis and many of these comorbidities that are associated with the treatments that they undergo for cancer. Um, you touched on something in terms of uh, what I think might be a perception of cancer and you know, corrected it in terms of saying living with cancer. What element of uh, I'm, my background would be more in the psychology of exercise. So what would you speak to in terms of the psychology of exercise and exercise as relates to cancer um, patients? Like what is the connection? How do you refer? What's the... Well, what are you talking about the psychology, get, getting around it with the cancer patients themselves or with the trainers? Uh, with, the, with the patients themselves. This is more for, uh, yeah, somebody listening. Well, I, I think there's an overwhelming sense of fear. Um, most of them have gone through so much pain already that they are afraid they're afraid their body is going to fail them, um, whether it be in acute pain that's just, you know, for a short period of time or whether they're dealing with something that's chronic and they have to learn how to manage their pain. You know, in my case, 
I was very fortunate and I, I had my cancer. I had my thyroid removed. I'm on medication for the rest of my life. I struggle with my weight, but you know, God willing, if that's the worst thing that ever happens to me, so be it. Where I see other people who have amputations and who can't move their arm or, you know, they have sexual dysfunction or they have really bad depression, you know, on and on and on and on. And the thing that people don't realize, or I think we do realize it, but, but people, it's too easy to say that exercise could actually be the solution for all of these things, you know, that, that the medical field knows, they see all of the, this evidence showing study after study that it improves, um, minimizes depression, improves sleep, which helps in the healing process, uh, satisfaction with life, improves self-esteem, self-confidence. So if we can just get them to take that first step, and so the way I get around it is you start with things that they enjoy doing and you make that the exercise somehow or another. And in my workshops, I always use an example of a weekend warrior. So the guy who kind of plays basketball with his buddies all weekend and then drinks beer and eats pizza and, you know, he has prostate cancer and, you know, this, that and the other problem. But you know he needs to do flexibility. It'd be great for him to do yoga. He needs to, you know, get on a vegan green diet or whatever. But this guy's not going to do that. And if you say, we're going to do yoga and we're going to meditate and we're going to go green, that guy is going to leave. So regardless of what you believe, this is not the time where you and you force your beliefs on somebody else. This is where you engage them. So um, get, getting in tune with what they enjoy. And, and so back to my example with the basketball player, I, I might have them play horse or just dribble the ball or, you know, walk back and forth because he may not be able to run, whatever. If he feels good about being on that basketball court and, you know, maybe instead of saying, well, you're not allowed to eat pizza, I'm definitely going to tell him not to drink beer while he's going through treatment because that's not good. But, you know, what if we start with one thing? Can I get you to have one smoothie, you know, for breakfast? Can we start with a smoothie? You know, and we gradually incorporate these changes. Um, but if we force somebody to do what they need to do but don't necessarily want to do, we will lose them. Right. And I think that is, is the most critical thing. So the first, the first session is usually just an assessment and, and you know, doing the, the physical assessment, taking the health history and all that information. And then the second session, I've kind of put together all of what it is I'm going to do with them, gotten to know them a little bit, and then we, we begin gradually. And that's the make or break it. If I make them more sore, if I make them feel bad about themselves because they're incapable of doing something, if I don't encourage them properly, I lose them. And they may just give up on it altogether, not, not life, but exercise. Um, so it takes a, a really empathetic and compassionate person to work with this population. But then you're also going to have the other extreme, which are the athletes who get cancer, who want to jump right back into running a tri or, or competing in a triathlon or running a marathon. And then I have to go, whoa, Nelly, you know, I, I get what you want, but let's, let's look at this logically and let's look at, you know, A, B, C, and D and figure it's going to take us a little while to get you to D, but we'll get there safely. Right. So, right. You know, it's it's a lot. It's 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 a lot to be responsible for, and I think that scares a lot of trainers. Um, but without risk, you know, not to be cliche, which I'm about to be, but without great risk, you right. don't have that great reward. And my whole career has been a risk. Uh, at a time where there was no cancer exercise, there was no medical fitness, and you know, I'm just little old personal trainer Andrea knocking down the doors at Georgetown University trying to get people to listen to me. And here I am 22 years later, and really it's now just coming of age. I mean, it's, it's been an uphill climb. And, and you know, people have, have followed suit, but as a whole, the medical field has not 100% embraced it. And so what I'm hoping through the Medical Fitness Network and the Medical Fitness Education Foundation and Medical Fitness TV, that as we pull all these amazingly talented professionals um, who are credible and intelligent and have a really strong background in medicine, fitness, whatever, 
that we earn this um, hierarchy in the spectrum, you know, where just because somebody's a doctor doesn't necessarily circumvent uh, or, or limit, you know, what where we fit in that, that totem pole. Because right now, I, I look at it, you've got the doctors, the surgeons, the nurses, the PTs, the OTs, and then the fitness professionals. And, and there's a place for that. But in recovery, the fitness professionals really need to be at the top because we're the ones that should be working with the clients at that point. Once they've left that comfort net, of their physical or occupational therapist or their surgeon, that's the next step in survivorship. Mm -hmm. So we can be a partner for them in that transition, which I, it like literally gives me chills because I, I've, I've, although I'm not working with too many cancer patients right now, actually I'm not working with any. I have one client who doesn't have cancer that I'm working with right now. Um, I, I've given up training clients to to train trainers, but. When I think back on all the people that I've helped and even some of those whom I've lost in the process, it just, it, it really makes me feel satisfied with the choices that I've made. And at the end of the day, if I died tomorrow, which God willing, I won't, I feel like I've at least left a mark. Mm. And that's more than a lot of people can say. So although I'd like to make a bigger mark, um, you know, at, at least I've started the bleed. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you said so many fantastic things in there, uh, and uh, this is really about you, but I want to jump on to what you said about, uh, you know, without great risk, there's not necessarily great reward, but I think what you do in terms of educating professionals and what we're doing with the Medical Fitness Education Foundation together is really reducing the risk but still keeping that level of reward, so the best scenario with low risk. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, I, I think that the Medical Fitness Network is going to be this umbrella bringing all of us who are kind of pioneers in this medical fitness industry together. And when we take all of our strengths together, you know, we have this united front, which I think it, it's always better when you have a group of people to, to back you. Yeah, and the strength in numbers. Uh, tell me about the art that is behind you. What uh, are you a uh, collector of art? Did you do yeah. that? It's actually pretty funny because uh, when I did have a full load of clients, one of my clients owned an interior store, and one of them was a custom framer. So I traded, and you know, like these things are, and I lo I love this. This was from the lady who had the interior store, and then. This was from the, the lady who did the framing. And I have nothing of color in my house. It's all very, well, it, it's earth tones. And she's like, you need a pop of color. <laughs> so, so this one area I have, like I have uh, my tablecloth. I'm, I'm, you can't probably see it, but it's kind of like this. And it's got lemons on it. So this one little area in the house is like colorful. Yeah. Everything else is... Um, Upstairs, it's all ski themed and, and vintage ski posters and vintage skis and snowshoes and whatever. Um, and then down here, it's, this is a hundred year old house. So it was a little bungalow and we took the roof off last summer and it's basically taken a year to put the new floor on and it's been, it's been quite the ordeal. Now, uh, in speaking of art, um, oftentimes when people go through traumas, or not necessarily traumas, but uh, amazing life experiences, um, they mark that time or experience in their life with uh, a kind of art, tattoos. Do you have any tattoos? <laughs> oh, you had to bring up the tattoos. Well, mine would be from Poor Judgment. Uh, and more to do with ex-husbands than uh -huh. life experiences, but you could quantify that as life experiences. Um, <laughs> so I have a couple butterflies on my back that, uh, and then these kanjis that say trust, believe, and forever. Well, obviously it wasn't. Right. Uh, and then I was stupid enough to get somebody's name tattooed on my lower back, and now it is a couple of hibiscuses. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> it's definitely a reminder to make better choices. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, 
just a couple more questions for you. Uh, you probably spoke to it already today, but um, in terms of getting involved with Medical Fitness Network so many years ago, um, and now uh, really kind of diving in even more so with the, the Medical Fitness Education Foundation, what was your motivation or why is it important to you to be connected to this organization in particular? Well, from a, a personal perspective, uh, Lisa Doherty, who is, of course, the president, um, she and I began talking four years ago when this was more or less a vision for her, and we just connected. Um, both of our fathers had cancer. We've both lost our fathers in the last couple of years. We've just had all of these parallels in our lives of had so many crossovers and I, I you know I, I feel like we've become really close and, and good friends in the process but we share a vision and I think that the, the two of us are extraordinarily passionate about what we do and probably a lot of people couldn't keep up with our energy We're, I, I mean I know sometimes I can't even keep up with Lisa and and people would say I'm a handful so you put the two of us together God help us and and I, I feel like the two of us together, we really have each other's back and um, that we can help one another achieve our, our dreams individually and collaboratively. And I believe in what, what she's doing. I mean, I've been doing it for 22 years on a, on a smaller scale. So it's just the right fit. It has to, it has to happen. Uh, last question for you, are there any projects that you have planned for 2018 that you can share uh, with us in terms of maybe a new book or um, your educational um, package is going to a different type of uh, delivery system? Are there any uh, projects? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, uh, in October, this past October, I launched with the American Council on Exercise, so they are um, selling my course exactly as it is, the Cancer Exercise Specialist Advanced Qualification. I've also signed contracts with NFPT and PTA Global PT on the net, um, which have pretty much the same versions, but some of them are, you know, one person is doing it all online or another one's providing hard copy books. And there's a couple more that we're in the process of some intro courses that I think people You'll know it when, when, when they see it, and we're really excited about that. I'm working with Lisa on that. Uh, I have just finished the Cancer Exercise Specialist Advanced Qualification 11th edition, so that just basically came off the press. Um, the Breast Cancer Recovery BOSU Specialist is our other um, main course, and then we have a new course coming out, which will hopefully be done in the next couple of months, which is called Pound Palms for Recovery. And it is using one pound weighted pom poms that were invented by uh, my colleague in San Antonio, not San Antonio, Austin. I always get it confused. Uh, she's awesome, Cherry Shamrock. And, um, and it's for breast cancer survivors. And she realized that a lot of the movements in cheerleading, I wasn't a cheerleader, as you can tell. Uh, imitate some of the things that need to be done to regain range of motion after breast cancer surgery or to prevent lymphedema. So we collaborated and we've put it all together. The book just needs to be edited and then we're ready to go. So I think there'll be a lot that will be coming of age, if you will, and people will be able to see it on our website um, and Facebook and all that good stuff. So um, I don't know if you provide all that contact information or do you want me to just give a little commercial, <laughs> but... Uh, we'll find a way. Yeah, we'll uh, find a way to get it up there. I'm not one to toot my own horn, so if I get all flustered, <laughs> that's why. Well, I think what's great is uh, the passion that comes through, and uh, even if you are promoting uh, coursework, uh, I think the, the viewers can tell that uh, it's coming from a... a a deeper place than uh, looking to make money, and I think that's uh, partly why we wanted to get to know you today, uh, do a little interview with you. Um, as we close out, uh, I'd like to give uh, the guest a final word to bring us out. Uh, before I do that, because um, we are between the shoots, uh, I'd like to offer you some bamboo shoots. I don't know if you can, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> They're really Thank not. You. That was fabulous. <laughs> yeah, <They're, clears throat> I might have to assault them or something. Although that's probably not good. 
dip them in chocolate. Andrea Leonard, it was a pleasure to speak with you, and um, thank, you. thank you so much for your time. Please, uh, with the last minute or so, just uh, some final thoughts uh, for the viewers, and uh, and then we'll all see you in uh, New Jersey when you give your yeah, time. no, that that'd be great. Um, I just I would like to thank you for for recognizing the fact that I don't appear to be driven by money, and it really is a passion of mine. I lost my father three years ago to his third cancer. My mom also had thyroid cancer. I've had 21st degree relatives who've had cancer. I just had my 15th breast lump removed. It was negative, thank God. But um, it, it it's so important, whatever it is, to find what you love, find your calling, and then be the best that you can be. And I can stand behind our program and say that I know without a doubt we provide the most comprehensive material that is out there. And I, as long as I am able, will answer the phone, will respond to emails and texts because I never want to lose that personal touch. I don't want to become that, you know, corporation that, that I get lost in the shuffle. So that is my closing words. Or those right. aren't the closing words. Andrea Leonard, thank you very much. And um, we will see you again soon. All right. Thanks, Tony.